Thank you, Sam. I occupy somewhat um, unfamiliar ground for myself in that I'll be speaking about something that I'm really not sure about. This is my uh, third out of four speaking engagements this week, and I'm not at all afraid to stand up and speak about things that I'm familiar with, that I've studied, that I may be considered in some people's mind an authority on. But tonight I'm finding myself speaking on a subject that really I still really have to figure out. Now, two days ago in Vancouver, I was giving a seminar on chronic illness, on the body's relationship to the mind, on stress and its relationship to health and, um, and um, sickness. And in the audience was a woman who works as a palliative care hospice chaplain in Portland, Oregon. And in the course of the discussion, she said that she noticed that people die as they live, which is, for me, a rather frightening thought, because I realized there's a lot of things I haven't figured out yet. And I saw the same thing in palliative care and looking after terminally ill people, is that really how people go through the dying process very much reflect how they live their lives. And to have a good death, you've had to have a good life. I've always known that, um, that what happens to people early in life has a huge impact on that life. Um, studies are totally clear on that, that whether you end up with chronic illness or addiction or mental illness is not a random event, nor is it um, determined by strictly or even largely by genetic inheritance. A lot of it depends on what happens to you early. A study only this week showed that men who were sexually abused have three times the risk of a heart attack when they grow up to be adults. And many, many other such studies. So that the question of growing old and uh, aging gracefully, to me, has at least intellectually resolved, resolved itself into letting go of baggage. Because we all accumulate baggage. We enter the world relatively free, uh, relatively unencumbered. And then, depending on what happens to us and how stressed the environment is around us and what demands are imposed on us already in the crib and perhaps already in the uterus, and yes, demands can be imposed even on a child in the womb, depending on what we are burdened with, then we carry those burdens all our lives. And it's those burdens then that, in my mind, and according to a lot of research evidence, show up in the form of illness, show up in the form of all kinds of dysfunctions. Now, I can talk about this, and I can teach it, and I can show you the proof, but I can tell you that I haven't resolved it in myself. And to me, the idea of growing old gracefully is actually to leave the world as free and unencumbered as we entered it. And that necessarily means letting go of baggage. Now, recently, I participated in a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat in Merit, BC. It's a silent retreat that for nine days you just don't speak to anybody except about very um, logistical matters, but there's no conversation, there's no internet, there's no distraction, there's no television, there's no reading, there's no writing, there's no music. There's just silence, you and your mind. And what I came to realize in that at the end of those 10 days, I thought I'd come to find some solutions and instead, I chanced upon, or didn't chance upon, found myself in the midst of a huge problem, which is I found myself full of anxiety. And I realized very quickly that, that that anxiety, which hasn't yet left me, that that anxiety is the anxiety that I've carried all my life. And that anxiety relates back to my own beginnings as a Jewish infant in the ghetto of Budapest under Nazi occupation and the stresses that my mother endured while she was carrying me in the womb and, of course, during that terrible first year, 1944, of my life. And I thought I'd resolve those issues, but you know, I hadn't. I had only masked them. And what I became aware of is that I'd masked those issues by all the work that I do. Now, I can mask them in other ways, by acquisition and, and uh, compulsive behaviors, Recently, my wife Ray and I saw a film, um, The Queen of Versailles, a wonderful documentary about this American couple, very wealthy, 
whose lives center around their possessions, the man's life centers around his work, and there seemed to be a complete emptiness in him. He's completely scared to let go of his identification with work. Well, I've been like that. And so the books that I've written and the work that I've done as a physician and all the speaking that I do, they have their own value and they have their own role in the world. But I've also realized that I've used them. I've used them not to be aware of the anxiety. And the anxiety is at the core. And truly that anxiety has to do with the fact that I'm still looking for that connection. Connection with who? Connection with what? Well, that connection with myself. And we do live in a world, we do live in a world that distracts us, that rewards us for being externally motivated, for being externally driven, for focusing on what the world thinks of us, for focusing on how we look or what we acquire, what status we um, attain, or simply with what we do. But there's very little reward, there's very little recognition, appreciation for simply who we are. And we very much are scared to be who we are. In fact, we don't even know who we are. And it seems to me that growing quote gracefully, if it means anything at all, it means that finally we get to know who we are. Now, the great Canadian stress researcher, Hans Selye, said that the stresses on human beings in modern society are largely emotional ones, and the biggest stress of all is trying to be who you're not. So my intention is, I can tell you, is once this crazy speaking schedule of mine runs down this fall that I've imposed on myself, at some point next year, I'm going to take a sabbatical and I'm going to do nothing at all whatsoever. Because my task will be that before it comes to close these eyes, I really want to find out who I am apart from all the activities. Thank you.